I'm fortunate to be one of thousands of medical students who graduated from the Howard University College of Medicine who were impacted by the outstanding teacher, master surgeon, humanist that is Dr. LaSalle D. LaFall. Dr. LaFall was born in 1930 in Quincy, Florida, and out of modest beginnings in the segregated South, grew a richness of instruction that he and his sister would receive from their parents, who were both teachers. He went to Florida A&M College, FAMC, later to become known as FAMU, at the age of 15. Dr. LaFall entered the Howard University College of Medicine at the age of 18 and graduated just shortly after his 22nd birthday. Could you tell us a little bit about the inspirations, the events or the heroes that prompted you to go into surgery in general and cancer surgery in particular? Very well. When I came to the Howard University College of Medicine in September 1948, Dr. Charles Richard Drew was chairman of the Department of Surgery. And I'd heard so much about him and what he had done in surgery, what he had done in research as far as blood and plasma preservation. And having heard so much about him and his leadership in surgery, his leadership at the Department of Surgery here at Howard, I said, I want to be a surgeon. I want to become a surgeon. On March 31st, 1950, Dr. LaFall was a sophomore medical student attending the last lecture that Dr. Drew would ever give. Students don't have class at Howard on Saturday night, the medical school, but when I was a second year student, we had class on Saturday. And I can remember very well we were having class in the medical school. Dr. Walter Booker, professor of pharmacology, was lecturing to us. And I used to always sit on the front row because I didn't want to miss anything. I'm sitting on the front just writing all these notes. And a person came in, I think it was somebody we called Long Tall Miller. Miller was about 6'4", that was Long Tall Miller, a laboratory technician in the Department of Pharmacology. And he whispered something to Dr. Booker. I couldn't hear what he said. I'm on the front row, but I still couldn't hear what he said. But Dr. Booker's face turned ashen. And he then turned to Miller and said this, you shouldn't joke like that on April Fool's Day. I can always remember that because it was April 1st, 1950. I was a sophomore medical student. He said, you shouldn't joke like that on April Fool's Day. And what did Miller say? He said, oh, I wouldn't joke like that. In other words, you might think about saying something about you left the lights on and all that, but you're not going to say the chief of surgery was killed in an automobile accident. So Dr. Booker then turned to us and said, I have some very sad news for you. Our chief of surgery was just killed in a tragic automobile accident just outside Burlington, North Carolina, on his way to a medical surgical meeting in Tuskegee, Alabama. Class is dismissed. It was just hard to describe the way we felt. This man was so big, we wondered if the medical school would survive. Now, we know full well that no one person is bigger than any institution. We know that. But still, he cast such a, a giant shadow, such a big shadow, that we were wondering, could the medical school survive? Well, obviously, it, it did survive, but that's how we felt, just totally saddened, and how could this be? And uh, that was it. A Saturday morning, April 1st, 1950, in a class in pharmacology, being lectured by Dr. Walter Booker. Uh, I understand that small hospital where they were taken, trauma care being what it might have been in 1950, totally different from what we think about 55 years later. But the hospital, or the only other person hospitalized would be Dr. Ford. And in fact, he was hospitalized. He was put in a room in the basement set aside for black patients. Perhaps that's why people have mistakenly assumed that at this hospital in the segregated mm -hmm. South, that do all that could have been done for Dr. Drew was not done. Yes. Could you set that record straight? I, I would be happy to do that. Um, and when I went down to Burlington, North Carolina, I should mention, in April of 1983, 33 years after Dr. Drew died, I went down to Burlington, North Carolina, and I wanted to talk to the people who had helped take care of him. The administrator of the hospital was still there. One of the surgeons who took care of him, one of the Canola brothers, was still there. A couple of the nurses were there, and one black was there. He happened to be an orderly, which is what you would expect and if there were going to be uh, a black person employed at that hospital. And I had a chance to talk to all of them. And going there, I found out that when Dr. Drew was brought in, 
that uh, they knew that he was coming. But I should mention this, because when I was there, there was a lady who was a nurse anesthetist, Miss Lucille Crabtree. She was not there when I went down there in April. And she said, but Dr. LaFall, I'm coming up next month with my son, his wife, and my grandson. I'll be happy to talk with you then. So if I can jump to that, that lets you know what happened then. She said, we only ran one room on Saturday. And I had a patient on the table. I was getting ready to give my patient some pentothal. And then I was going to put in a tube for the operation we were going to do. They called from downstairs and said, there's been a very bad accident out by Hall River. They're bringing in some patients. One of them is critically injured. And she said, I am so glad I hadn't given my patient on the operating room table some pentothal because I could not leave a patient whose life I have placed in jeopardy by giving him some pentothal, something that decreases respirations and go to a patient whose life is in jeopardy. But I hadn't given anything. So she said, I put my endotracheal tube and my laryngoscope in my pocket. I ran downstairs. And when Dr. Drew came in, I was downstairs waiting along with other people who were there. She described this to me. She said that his pupils were dilated both. There was blood coming from his ears. He had a crush wound of his chest and an avulsion wound of his thigh. And she said he was breathing in a very shallow manner, very shallow. And she said he was in deep shock and his blood pressure was in the low numbers. And she thought it was in the range of the 60s. And I'm going to mention something about his record in a moment. So she said then what she did, she got an endotracheal tube, a laryngoscope put the endotracheal tube in. And she said, Dr. LaFall, we were all sitting there and she said, I, not a, a bragging eye, not a bragging eye, but a sincere, thoughtful, genuine eye. She said, I was with him from the time he arrived until the time he died. I put the endotracheal tube in. I gave him IV fluids. Not that I was the only one there. Other people were there too, but we cared genuinely about him. And we were thinking about transferring him to Duke, only because Duke is a university. Alamance General Hospital is a little hospital. But we didn't have the time to get him there. His condition did not allow us to transfer him to Duke. I then asked her, did he get any plasma or blood? And she said, he did receive plasma, but they didn't have blood then. She said, Dr. Ford, we were a little hospital. We didn't have blood at that time. And by the time blood was available, he was dead. And so based on everything that we know, the accounts from Dr. Bullock, who's a trained surgeon who was in the car, they were in Dr. Bullock's car, as a matter of fact, when the accident occurred. The two residents, surgical residents, who themselves knew about trauma care, said that Dr. Drew received the best care that could be given at that time in our history in a hospital of that size. Knowing, however, what was going on in the South at that time, a myth has been created about Dr. Drew's death that we probably will never erase. Because I go around, I give a lot of lectures on Dr. Drew. And some people look at me as though I'm really being a traitor to tell the truth. And I said, no, we have to tell the truth. That's the one thing we must do, we must tell the truth. And after that, one of the men he had trained, Dr. Jack White, had gone to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for his training in surgical oncology. And that was related to the fact that Dr. Drew knew the men who were in charge of the program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Then when Dr. White came back, he talked so much about surgical oncology and what he had learned at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I then said, well, I want to do that. Then Dr. White arranged for me to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center from 1957, July 1957, to December 1959. Another surgeon I'd like to mention is Dr. Burke Mickey Syfax, who was called Master of the Abdomen. He was a great diagnostician and a great technical surgeon. And I think about the men whom I knew who had taught me so much the three people in surgery, Dr. Drew, Dr. Syfax, Dr. White, but there's one other, my professor of anatomy, Dr. W. Montague Cobb, professor and head of the Department of Anatomy. I learned so much from him. Those four people were my heroes in the College of Medicine. We were advised as medical students to read a book called Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. And that's why today my favorite quotation is equanimity under duress, which means maintaining that degree of calmness and tranquility that will allow you to do what's appropriate in any circumstance. So William Osler has been called the father of modern medicine. 
He was professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins and Regis professor at Oxford. On one occasion, he was asked, what's the secret for success in medicine? He said, I'll tell you what it is. I'll even spell it for you. W-O-R-K, work. It's the open sesame for all portals, the true equalizer in the world, the true philosopher's stone which transmutes all the base metal of humanity into gold. The stupid among you it will make bright, the bright it will make brilliant, and the brilliant it will make steady. With this magic word in your heart, all things are possible, and without it, all is mere vanity and vexation. Because of your work, you're well known, obviously, in our profession, through the college, through various surgical societies, but one is as likely to see you with presidents and former presidents, with uh, dignitaries from across the spectrum. There's one president I got to know quite well, that's President Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. He worked with us on a program at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Great progress has been made, and with your help, we believe we can continue to make progress. And they were very active in something we call the National Dialogue on Cancer, a sea change. Could you touch on some of the things you had to deal with as it relates to prevention? One of the main things that I had to deal with was something called cancer health disparities. Despite the increased incidence of cancer in African Americans and Hispanics, so often they could not get into the system, could not have a diagnosis made, could not be treated. That was something we had to deal with. And as a member who was very active with the American Cancer Society, the Society sponsored the first conference on the challenge of cancer in black Americans. We also included other ethnic groups where there was a cancer health disparity, and we want to be absolutely certain that all persons, men, women, children, receive the very best care in terms of diagnosis and treatment. So that's been a major problem. When one takes a walk down the hallway that connects the Howard University Hospital with the Howard University College of Medicine, you have the opportunity to walk by the sequential photographs of graduating med school classes ranging all the way back into the 1920s. You'll notice that starting from the early 1960s when Dr. LaFall joined the faculty, going forward to nearly 50 years, Dr. LaFall is virtually a perennial honoree among the very few honored faculty that are named by each graduating class. Indeed, it's remarkable to note that there are parents and their children who are graduates of Howard University College of Medicine who are both members of classes that honored Dr. LaFall, a span of teaching excellence that is unmatched in the history of the Howard University College of Medicine. Dr. Drew had a famous statement he would make, particularly when he spoke to students. He said, excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. I never forgot that. What he was saying is, if you do it well enough, people have got to notice it.